Hi, I'm Hilary Walton, and this is the Digital Culture Ideas Show. This is a show about how technology has significantly shaped the way we think, interact, behave, and communicate. In short, this is a show about technology and people. If you're enjoying this show, please make sure you subscribe, and I would really appreciate a review. That would mean the world to me. If you want to also follow some of the other work we do, then please look out for the professional groups on LinkedIn and Facebook, the Digital Culture Ideas Group, and also the New Zealand Digital Leaders Network. On today's podcast, I am really excited to have Ryan Ashton, or Ryan the Lion, as most of you will know him. Now, Ryan is a prolific person who interviews pretty much everybody in the tech industry and beyond. And so I'm really excited to be able to turn the tide on that and actually interview him for a change. So Ryan is best known for creating a few quiet yarns. Now this is the no selling tech networking event, which has grown out of his years in sales and marketing experience across the tech industry. But what really drives him and what's behind AFQY and Ryan the Lion, which you'll hear about during the show, are a collection of experiences that drive him to co-create a better world for humans to coexist in psychologically safe environments so we can thrive. And we know how important feeling psychologically safe is. During our chat together, Ryan and I cover a myriad of topics, and you'll notice that this particular show goes on slightly longer than some of the other ones I've done, but he really does have some fantastic stories that I just wanted to make sure I captured, and so we had such a great discussion. We talk about people and technology, obviously, also culture change, but not just culture change in business. You see, this show takes a little bit of a turn and starts to talk about culture change in society. So we cover diversity and inclusion because we're both super passionate about that. But we also talk about other um, injustices in the world, um, for example, child sex abuse and also the Me Too movement. And we talk about, you know, that actually we need to wake up to some of these injustices in certain groups um, and make sure that we are being fair to everyone and treating everyone with the same respect that they deserve. And so that was a big topic within the the show about fixing the status quo when it actually needs it and what some of the lessons are there. But we also talk about AFQY as well. Um, And this is, you know, really kind of started as a gem of a a business idea, but it really has, I truly believe, grown to be so much more. And he's managed to take some of those Um, traits that he has around wanting to do good and empathizing with others and, you know, doing things for the good of world. And he's trying to weave that into his business. And I think you can really see that because he's starting to make some cultural and behavioral changes through his events and through the training and consultancy that he does into business. And that's why I am so extremely pleased to have this interview with Ryan the Lion. (laughs) <laughs> so Ryan, how are you? I'm pretty good, thanks, Hilary. Um, yeah, we're what week eight since the beginning of lockdown. Um, you know, COVID nineteen, twenty twenty, market and history. It will be spoken about in history forever. But um, all things considered, um, doing pretty well, thanks. Awesome. And I was wondering, do you do you remember how we met, kind of serendipitously? Yes, I do, um, and there's there's a there's a bit I wasn't aware of, but um, I'll wrap that. I'll tell my story, and then you can um, add to it. So, um, what, one of the things I do because um, I AFQI, which we'll talk about at some point, is a community, and it's very community focused in how it behaves and acts, and, and part of that is um, supporting people and supporting other communities, right? Because it's all about the people. So it's not just about the AFQI community; um, it's about all possible communities. So I thought um, I would buy tickets to an event and um, share them, but people had to engage and ask question, answer a question as to how. And um, there were five tickets. I think you know, 
your five tickets. Yeah, you know, five so, range of, yeah. yeah, the range of people answered, and um, and actually, this is a bit I didn't know, but I believe you answered, and I didn't um, respond to you, and we didn't see that or whatever the case was. So my humblest apologies. Um, but <laughs> if good fortune comes to those um, uh, who, who, know, who know someone who knows someone. So um, while I had missed that, um, I was waiting for a fifth answer. Oh, no, that's why I think fifth, the fifth person ended up having to cancel. So I had to go back and find a fifth person. And Matt had already said, um, I've got another person um, who'd love to come. And uh, you know, you're know, both in Christchurch and they're ready to buy tickets. They've got to buy tickets. Can they buy? And I just went, well, that's all the hard work done. That person can have a ticket. And it ended up being yourself. That's so, it. Um, so we met at Gary V. Um, what was Gary V? Yeah, I think there's some other speakers there as well. But I'm pretty sure we were all there to see Gary Vaynerchuk. Gary live yeah. after sort of listening to him for a while and that's it like it was literally days before the event and I hadn't seen it advertised and then I did and I was like oh no I've missed I've missed the opportunity that's sold out and I thought oh, I'm just gonna try and reach out to the network online on social media and just kind of see what happens you know what you know what what would I lose and um yeah and that's when Matt Jones got in touch with me and he said I might be able to get you one and then that's when, yeah, I got a, a ticket from you and, and free of charge as well, which was so incredibly generous. And well, so was, I bought my airline ticket, <laughs> much to my husband's yeah, well, yeah, dismay. free of charge. So. <laughs> but yeah, the, the, there was, I think there was, were the $25 tickets, I think? So it wasn't like they were 200 and, you know, or two and a half thousand. That's just not possible for me. <laughs> but, but $25 tickets and they filled that room, I think it was like a thousand people. So it was 250k yeah. days. The Ray, so twenty five dollars a ticket's not too bad, um, and uh, the, the whole part of it was not only to go out and reach out to the community and, and attract people in, uh, but yes. also to share that. So part of the, your commitment in, in receiving a free ticket was to be uh, part of some of the posts and the social media story. So um, from my perspective, it was it, it touched on a whole lot of things that AFQY is all about: connecting people, um, finding good people some good stories there's a good yarn in that uh and yeah. sharing an experience together that uh, we could that's share right with so, and we've yeah. been in contact on and off when i've been up to auckland and been trying to connect probably a lot sooner but um yeah <laughs> good to finally be doing something with you now so i think it took me a while to get my act together in terms of this kind of stuff also so yeah no no that's all right we've been planning the a yarn with and as we know um that we'll tell everyone it was meant to be before yeah. this, but I thought I had lost the LinkedIn Live rights, and the the little bit, the little sidebar on the LinkedIn profile disappeared, and I didn't. I thought, is that because I've taken too long? Because there was a time limit. You've got to do your first one in the time limit, yes. or you lose it. And I was, I thought I was twenty days away from it. Um, but then also I thought, oh, maybe because I've hooked up Streamyard and it's talked to it, it takes it away because that's the alert saying, got to use it, got to use it, got to use it. Because I was hooked up, they must have. And I thought maybe it turned off. So. I actually did a, a trial um, the night we night we were meant to. You were meant to be the first, and the night yes. that night we the um, trial at like eleven o'clock at night. And you've got to be yeah. for more than fifteen minutes, or else you just <laughs> put a recorded video up. So I spoke for half an hour to myself. You did. History of AFQY at twelve thirty at night or something, and there was twenty people watching. <laughs> so I was like, okay, <laughs> it works. Um, Holy yeah. moly! I've definitely watched it since, but uh, yeah, I didn't watch the live vision. But awesome, and you know, good on you for actually having LinkedIn Live because not everyone can get accepted for that as well, Ryan. So that says a lot about you know the work you're doing in the communities you're building and things like that. So that's fantastic. Thank and you. I think with um, you know when we have spoken recently, we've talked about you know technology kind of being the backbone of what you've done, and certainly that's evident in some of the backstory that you have been given on that LinkedIn Live and in other things as well. Um, but I agree with that. But I also want to just challenge you because from my perspective, and I guess I've got kind of digital culture on the mind, but I always felt like and people was a and technology and people was a big part of who you are and what you've been doing. Um, and I think that's why you're you know, going to be such a great person to interview today. So do you agree with that or has that just been a recent kind of realization? Absolutely. Um Absolutely, and I think I think a lot of people would easily agree with that for different things that they haven't that aren't so well joined together. So let me join a few dots for everybody, including yourself. Um, 
AFQY uh, was never intended to be uh, what it is today. Um, I guess that, that, that might throw the cat amongst the pigeons in some regards. It becomes something way better. And um, initially it was quite selfishly to create a peer-to-peer -peer networking group um, where CIOs could peer-to-peer uh, -peer network. This was based off the feedback um, from the CIO Summit, which I used to sell the sponsorship to and be involved in, in running uh, back, in, back in the very early days of um, what is now the CIO Summit by Confriends and IDC. We used to be the third um, arm being Fairfax, but they dropped out with the, okay. uh, the, loss, of the, with the loss of the titles. So, um, yeah, they wanted peer-to-peer -peer, peer -peer networking. That was the key thing. So I thought, well, let's just give them that. But um, I made it public, and of course, when the CIOs came, um, everybody else wanted to come and talk to them as well because they couldn't normally get access to them, but they could at AFQY. And mm -hmm. uh, I just rolled with it and then realized that it was um, the community and yes. I could see the opportunity to use that community. So uh, AFQY has a technology front with a real uh, people meaning tuck behind it. So if you watch that um, video, and actually if you attended AFQY, which you didn't, um, but those that attended AFQY in the first few years, you would have heard the full story around uh, the issues with sales um, and and buying, but predominantly sales and the stereotype. And yes. in terms of the issues that that creates, um, one of the stories I talk about is a, a person being fired for no fault of their own, but the outcome of a very bad um, sale being conducted basically pulling the wall over the buyer's eyes and down the track the company went what the hell is going on with this and yes. five different responsible um, for creating the, the problem and to me you know some will have seen my pink shirt day videos um, I bought out my first one three years ago uh, to the shock of most people because everyone went what Ryan the lion and that's like, yeah, well, everyone's got an outside mask and an inside mask. Yeah. I guess. You talk about people believe, don't you, in that picture video? And yeah. Sort of, yeah. And the first one was, um, uh, so what had happened as a kid, I coached at rugby. I'd forgotten about it, pushed it down. It still affected me, still had the rumination of all that stuff um, that everybody will have for their own issues, and we'll get into that because everyone's, is, everyone's got a something. I think the term is baggage. I don't like that, but. Everyone's had an experience or experiences that um, they still think about and it ruminates. And um, so you, you know, did the first one, it was sort of bringing it to the fore. And um, and from there on in, I've now moved to um, a more empowerment. But it started because age 37, I'm now 43, a kid that I coached at rugby who was an amazing, young, bright star, um, tried to commit suicide based on being cyberbullied. Um, I won't go into the details for privacy, uh, but that that just upset me so much because he was such an amazing kid, and I was like, "Oh my god, um, how dare that? How dare that happen to anyone else?" So it's, it's an, I don't know what it is, and you as a trained psychologist might know there might be some sort of term for this, but I really didn't want him to have to go through that or anyone else. So it fired me up. Like I actually went through six months of almost rage and anger about the situation, yeah. focused focused around him and the and the people involved in that, but also just more widely, um, openly, like, we've just got to, if I can say it, we've just got to fucking stop this bullshit. Um, yeah, it's absolutely. People's lives at, at the, you know, there's nothing more precious than people's lives. So um, hence the, the no selling rule of AFQY, which is what it's being built on, is actually changing human behaviour. It's identifying and making yeah. people think about it. And... I, I know that people try to cheat the rule, and I have uh, a couple of gamification principles in play. So there's consequences. If you are caught, um, you get red carded and walk down in front of everybody and I hold a big A3 red card up, um, and that's happened twice. And I actually, mm. have, I actually have CIOs ask if they can hold the red card up, and they ask if someone's been, if someone's going to be red carded. And that tells you that they as buyers have had a bad experience, just like me having been bullied, had a bad experience. So they're as passionate about seeing this change. Um, so that, in terms of um, the people being tucked behind AFQY, if AFQY was sort of almost, people would see it as a, a um, commercial entity, it's a business, it's a networking event, um, but tucked in there are the no-selling rule. We can't ask for people's cards. You can't ask what a person does until the third question because they'll judge you. Um, yes. And... By telling these stories at the beginning, it's meant to set the scene and, and leave people with a, 
um, the thinking about it, the situations. And then also they, deliver, they, they operate under these rules. And at the end of the day, this is amazing. In fact, people used to cheer and clap when I told the full story, which involves all sorts of things from, you know, like the, the famous pregnant pause from the BHP merger. There was four hours of two CEOs staring at each other, waiting for the first to speak because the, the first to speak loses. And my point <laughs> is, what, what bullshit? Why live in a world like that? Yeah. Um, why not go, let's get this sorted, get it done in 15 minutes, and then go and pick up the kids and go to the beach together for the rest of the three hours. And when I make yeah, exactly. a lot of a lot of senior people in the room would go, yeah, yeah, that's we should. Um, so it's it, really cut that bull crap out. Yeah. So all the game playing, um, all the we'll say lies and deceit, um, and you know the 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 lies and deceit that are um, put across or put out as truth. Oh, oh no, yes. I didn't mean that. Oh no, you've got me. You take me the wrong way. I meant this. It's like. I think you clearly said the sky was pink with uh, green polka dots. I mean, we all know it's blue, mate. So, you know, let's call a spade a spade. Um, exactly. um, so, yeah, so in short, AFQY is a technology front. My background is in technology. My mum's a CIO. I've grown up through technology. Um, you know, back in the days of Commodore 64, and we had the only computer, um, and every kid used to come to our place and play, <laughs> computer, program the computer. Um, but my brother also went into IT, so I literally never got to fix a computer. Uh, therefore, I still can't fix a computer. Um, and in, in my travels, uh, working with the Manaya Kalani Trust, who run the schools out of Point England, um, the kids start using computers at age eight, and they can do screen replacements, key replacements, hard drive swap outs, you name it, at the age of eight. Wow, that is cool. With, a, with an illustrious family in IT, um, I can't even, <laughs> don't even ask me. Um, yeah, so I, I swapped from a PC to a Mac, so I didn't have to do the, the three finger salute. Um, yeah, I'm a real <laughs> for dummies, um, but oh, my gift in technology is the, is the ability to explain it. So transfer the knowledge from the technical people who can't always explain it in layman's to the business person on the other side uh, and join those dots together. Um, so I can understand yeah, it. Absolutely. it. <laughs> and that's where I sit in IT and security as well, between the really technical people and, and the business kind of translating. Um, yep. And one of the things I, I like to do on this show is I like to sort of get people's take on what, what digital culture means to them. So not like a textbook kind of answer or anything like that. Um, but, yeah, what's your take on digital culture? What does that mean for you? Um, so I'm a bit worried I could be about to say something that's a tech book, textbook thing, but... And that's because I come from the tech industry and digital literacy um, has been a big discussion and, you know, sort of probably biased or fed, you know, have those ideas in my head. So if I try to sort of think about what is a digital culture. Um, yeah, I think it's, I think it, I think it spans the, the individual to the organization, to the, the, you know, wider people, but it's mm. for me, digital culture is related to the ability to, um, adopt and adapt um, with digital. So whether that's yeah. using using like my like my father, um, who's the uh, the luddite, um, he once tried to change the TV channel with a calculator and got frustrated just before an, an All Blacks Test match. And Mum had to <laughs> said, "Why don't you try with the remote and give me the calculator?" And he's like, mm -mm. <laughs> um, okay. "Managed to see the um, the anthem system time for the Harker, of course." So. Uh, so, and that's where the ability to explain tech to, from tech people, uh, translate tech from the tech person's language to everyday language comes from. Um, but uh, yeah, digital culture for me is, you know, we, we, we live in a digital world. There's a lot of stuff that's hidden in digital. Like we probably, people don't re realize the extent of how digital a car is or, or was. Mm. Now it's really mm. quite clear. But for me, digital culture is more about um, the propensity of a person to use digital whether you are a digital native and, and it's like the back of your hand or whether you're someone like my yeah. father who um, um, used to have my mum do all his email and communications with rugby people around the world until she went on a work trip for two weeks and um, you know she said, all right, I'll, I'll sit you down, you teach, I'll, I'll teach you how to do it. So he sat down and he did everything. He turned on the router, turned on the computer, opened it up, logged in, logged into the browser, started writing an email. Mum went, I thought you didn't know how to do this. And he's like, oh, no, I know how to do it. I just like you doing it for me. 
<laughs> so he's like, wow. So when he when mum came back, dad had also, because one of his mates had said, why don't you get into Facebook and you just chat in real time. So when mum come back from her um, work trip, dad had set himself up a Facebook account and had now connected with every rugby club and every rugby person in Facebook and spent all day like a teenager chatting to people about rugby. <laughs> through Facebook. Well, this is much better than an email. I can talk to them and I can talk to them like it's, it's infinite. It's like having one, a conversation. Maybe so, I did a really good job of teaching them the digital stuff, so it just kind of happened. And I, I think about that actually with this, um, with the show and what I'm doing. Like I think one day digital culture as a word won't even be a thing because you're right, everything is going to be digital. It's going to be completely part of our lives and careers and it'll just be what it is. We won't have to talk about digital transformation. It'll just no. be like... I think that was a buzzword to add a zero on the end of price tags, but um, yeah, the digital transformation. But I think there's also uh, the the gap. So they talk about the digital divide, right? And there are that's people true. that yeah. I think that's I think that's what helps define uh, digital culture, um, because those who aren't uh, who are on the wrong side of the digital divide certainly are not part of the digital culture. Um, mm. they, they are part of the digital culture. They're just not participants in, the, in it. Yes, yeah, that's yeah. right. And and speaking about, um, you know, I know like me, you're really passionate about diversity and inclusion. You know, you've done lots of different interviews on a range of different topics that fit under that banner. Um, you know, you've done interviews around child sexual abuse, around intersex, and you've been really outspoken on the the Me Too movement as well. So, um, you know, what makes that one of your missions? So. If you take my experience of bullying um, and then I look around at my mate and the person who interviewed um, uh, Akare Marasala Thompson, who is a child sexual abuse survivor, and you hear his story and it's different parts but the same thing. You know, where you go through a terrible experience, you come out the other end and you want to do something about it to, to help stop it happening. And that's why I look at it and, and I... I whether whether I can claim to or, or not, I I believe I th try to think holistically and, and fairly and think, well, it's not just about me and my problems. It's everybody and any problem. So if we're going to look after me and my problem, we're going to look after the next person and their problem. And, you know, I sort of look at, I look at the, um, you know, as, as we're growing up and we, we're young and enthusiastic, we, we see all these things and we want to change them because we recognise them. You know, a, a, kid, a kid is innocent. It doesn't have all the layers where they have, uh, you know, layers of experience, discussion, et cetera, uh, input that have changed their thinking. So if you strip all that all of life back and you just ask a kid, should a, should a, is it okay for a woman to be raped? Well, no. Is it okay for yeah. a person to be nasty to another bullying? No. Is it okay for a person to be nasty to another because of the color of their skin? Well, no. So, yeah, so there's all these things that happen in the world that we have um, accepted or um, as, a, as a global community or society on that sort of level we accept because when it comes down to the individual level and we're on our, what I call the barbecue soapbox at home and we go, what happened was really shit. That shouldn't have happened. How? how why? What are the courts doing? Why isn't this happening? Oh, da, 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 well, and then it's on to the rugby discussion. You know, so we we have this. I don't know if it's. I ask you as a psychologist. You know, the example I use is um, when we, we got taught in psychology one 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 or one one two. I can't remember. I did first year, and the there's a person who's the scenario is there's a person about to jump off the um, building and kill himself, and. Uh, uh, person by themselves individually will go no don't 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 you know i'll come and talk to you come you know get down get down but when there's a big group of people the exact same person that by an, as an individual said oh no, no don't don't jump don't don't end your life you know let's talk about it we can sort it out the, the, yes. you know, the same person that will be the one that calls up go on jump go on if that's what you want to do do it and it's human dynamics right so yeah um, yeah when we when I run AFQY in the tech and it's in the tech industry, it's eighty percent male. And at events after hours of alcohol, it's ninety percent male. It's not an actual representative split. And um, I I brought a took took years of encouragement, but a woman of consequence will say um, from the industry who wants to remain nameless. Happy for the story to be shared, but wants to remain nameless. 
came to AFQY and this is in the early days and we've just gone over 210 days and it was pumping it was like where's the future going what are we doing this is so cool and um i was looking for her and uh, the the venue had a you know separate area balcony um i finally found her out there and i just walked up to her and went, hey how's it going so what do you think of AFQY and i was sort of expecting um the same thing that everyone said, oh, this is amazing. The conversations have been fantastic. There's no selling, We're getting to know each other. And I've met someone whose kids have got in my ballet troupe and blah, blah, blah. And in turn, she said, this is a real sausage fest. And I choked <laughs> on my beer. Um, you know, one of those classic movie moments, I almost spat it all over her, to be honest, um, by accident. But I just couldn't believe what I heard. And I was like, mm. sorry, what? And she said, oh, there's so much social sexism here. It's not funny. And I went, sorry what i know what sexism is but what social sexism is it and just as i said that one of the most senior people in the industry for one of the biggest companies um walked up to me and went oh that's why i can't find you ryan and did a look up and down look on the lady um, uh, yeah and, and said that's why i can't find you you're hanging out with a with the pretty girl out the back and she just said mm. that and I was, I was already cringing before she said it, and it all just like cemented into place. I was like, that's what social sexism is. Comments by men, or women, um, but predominantly yeah. men, um, where it's identifying something based on sexuality or gender. And um, and uh, and I, I just quickly said, said hey, mate, um, yeah, I'm, I'm just about to come in for a beer. Why don't you go and get me a beer, get me a space, and I'll come to the bar and find you there. I'll just be a minute. So he went, oh, yeah, okay, and toddled off, which gave me the opportunity to say, what do you want me to do? I'll kick him out. That's disgusting. It's terrible. Yeah. And she said, no, because you kick him out, he doesn't learn anything. Um, she said, but do you go and talk to him or do something, you know, suggest how he could behave in a better way. So I said, okay, leave it with me. And I went out, grabbed him, took him outside on the street. And he's like, what are we doing? What are we doing? I said, this got to have a word with you in quiet and private. And um, I said, um, a couple of the guys, so I didn't even say it was a woman. Uh, I used guys. I said, a couple of guys have um, made comment to me about some of the comments you're making uh, to women or about women, and they thought it, they thought someone should let you know how it's looking because you and your role, you should know better because you probably deal with the complaints of your employees about this sort of stuff, and here you are openly doing what you're meant to be, you know, leading the change on. Yeah. And, um, and he didn't even click that he'd just done it two seconds ago in front of me. Didn't even click, right? So that's, yeah. that's yeah. how it can happen. And he went, oh, whoa, oh, shit, who do I need to apologise to? What, what, you know, and I said, no, no, no one wants an apology. They just want to see you behave the way we expect. You know, it's very easy to forget because AFQY is held at a bar for a specific reason, but because it's held, also because it's held at a bar, people think they're at a bar and forget that they're at a work event. And that, that shouldn't actually even matter whether you're at a work event or at a bar on your own personal time. Um, the That behaviour, that comment is still unacceptable. So Yes. He went in and um, he went back in and I said, you know, we'll say nothing more about it unless I get more complaints. I said, in which case I'll have to ask you to leave. And he's like, well, shit, that's serious. I said, oh, yeah, mate, yeah. So anyway, I went in and at the end, uh, a bunch of five or six women who weren't the woman um, walked up to me and said, um, we saw you take him outside. We wondered if it was about what it was about. And funnily enough, he didn't say anything, but he absolutely changed his behaviour. He was talking to us earlier in the wow. night and was – just disgusting, um, lewd, making suggestions, um, you know, up and down, locking them, and um, and he was the perfect gentleman after you took him outside. So what did you do? And I said I just had a quiet word with him. I had a quiet hour with him, um, and said that some men had noted about his behaviour. So, but come back to the beginning. Um, <laughs> So part of this, right, so growing up, two things for me was, one, my mum is now a CIO, um, but she took a IT system from paper through to IT, and she was one of the original, one of the early original women um, studying IT, and I used to go to university yeah. with her. Um, and pushing uh, glass ceilings by the sound of it as well. Yeah, sorry? And pushing glass ceilings by the sound of it as well, you know, I, as a CIO. Well, I won't comment on that one yet, but... Um, what, what did happen is that she would come home and she would talk about um, the fact that she'd had a meeting with, and this is when, this, and you got to remember, this is taking paper to IT, and there was all sorts of hobbyist you know, computer people that were building their own computers and all sorts of things happening, you know, and she was, you know, obviously studied and quite, into, quite, quite more advanced, 
And her boss, who was um, not in the IT field but was playing with IT like an enthusiast, would um, sit in a meeting with his leg crossed, like his ankle on his knee, his fly undone with his not 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 um, with underwear on, but his package poking out, and sit back with his arms folded behind his head and go, "You just don't know what you're fucking doing. You're a fucking woman. What, what would you know about IT?" And mum would come home and tell those stories. My dad, who's six foot five, you know, right. 50 kg, number eight, um, and a, a senior manager, um, but also, you know, wife, would uh, fire up. I'm going to go down there tomorrow and give him a piece of my mind. So the young person, um, hearing the story, mm. seeing dad's reaction, absolutely told me, this is not acceptable. You know, my dad wasn't the, the one that went, Oh yeah, well, did you? You know, did you? You know, he he showed how unacceptable that was, and um, and that that was one thing. Um, and I've actually written about this. There's an article in for International Women's Day. I always do a giveaway of tickets. Um, on this, which also led to the No Woman No Man theme, which I was just sharing a second. Um, but um, she went on to create um a system which the World Health Organization asked the New Zealand government if they could share with the rest of the world so that um, they got consistent reporting in the field that my mum works in. So literally, um, quite, quite, I think quite honestly, he can say that she created a world-class system that others are asking for. So that guy, he's the one that really doesn't know what he's doing. Um, but yes. there are all these examples, right? When I, when I interview people, um, so the likes of um, Nisha Clark, who's the CIO at Downer, yes. um, Valerie Walsh uh, from Zero, um, Chanel James. So we all, all, all discuss, had discussions off um, uh, camera and worked out yep. how they share a story. But the idea was share a story, give a bit of re reality, but then also give advice to young women, um, Angela, Angela Nash. Um, and it was so interesting, like this, some of the stuff that they experienced, they're not necessarily that, but um, certainly the, the male dominance um, attitude and what would a woman know type attitude. Um, but the, the clear message was, um, don't let anybody tell you what you can and can't do. Don't let what anyone says affect you, you know, brush it off, carry on. Um, and yeah, I can try to think, cause I think it was Angela Nash that was quite straightforward about it because <laughs> she is. Yeah, yeah. Um, and yeah, so if you think about, I think because of my experience, it then branches out to all those other experiences. And part of part of my experience is seeing my um, my mum go through there. Oh, the other one that I see, the Sulu too. So my mate across the road, John McKeera, is Cook Islander. Um, we grew up um, and we were nicknamed Two Boys because it didn't matter which name you called out, Two Boys would appear. So he's Cook Islander <laughs> and um, I'm obviously not. Uh, so um, racism, again, was a... A new thing for me. I think it was on a TV show that it first happened, and Mum and Dad explained it or tried to explain it. And then um, it also happened on on one. You know, we were walking home from school, and one of the other boys, who's a bit of a naughty boy and rat bag, and we didn't hang out with him, but he lived down the street. Um, he was racist um, towards um, John's cousin, and um, yeah, that that kicked off a huge. Um, huge situation scenario and i'm just trying to think the number of times that uh um john and i we played softball together we played at home together played on the computer at my place and played in the you know woods at his place across the road and then we played softball together and a few other things but yeah the, the number of times that i would experience um racism that was aimed at him and be like you know, couldn't could understand what obviously understand what was happening but just couldn't understand why people would do this you know, like yeah. we get real factual, you think of think of slavery, you go, who in their right mind could do this? Like you even watch that show, we've got the book here, it's in my, I was it a help? And like people are treating yes. people that way and they know it. Like how can you, how can you actually do that? So the point is that um, coming back to the wider picture, everybody, right? Everybody has something. Maybe not everybody yeah. has something, but there's a lot of people that do. And it could be, um, I think the easiest way to say it is all the isms. So there's sexism, racism, um, you name it. But um, if you think about this, one in four women and one in six men are sexually abused before the age of 15 in New Zealand. Mm -hmm. The global stat is something like one in six women under the age of 18. So we have wow. more. At a, by an earlier age 
Um, so you think you look around the, the team of 200 people at your company, yeah. or you look at an event with 150 people on it, statistically, one in four of the women and one in six of the men have been sexually abused. So um, with Akaray Marisala Thompson, um, uh, I, in some regards, I helped tell his story or break his story. So we did the interview and I edited it and did various cuts and um, then, yep, that's cool. And that really put it out there. But basically it was done in a way where um, you supported what he was doing. So his, he was um, sexually abused as a child. Mm. Um, he grew up angry and got involved in gangs. Um, social worker pulled him out and got him overseas for, for rugby and opened his eyes to the world. Like he said, I, I remember walking into a palace in France and looking at the place, I've never seen anything like it. You know, the, the ornate, you know, um, you know palace. I'm just going, wow, this is a long way from South Auckland and um, running gangs and you know, beating people up. And all yeah. sorts of stuff. So when he came back after injury, he got into the police for 12 years because he wanted to save other kids going through what he went through. Yeah. 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 Um, and then learned that he couldn't quite achieve what he wanted to. So he left the police and set up My River, which is an app which enables people to put in their details and um, reach out to social services and it will tell them what this local, there's, there's 97,000 social services in New Zealand. So if you just think of um, the helplines as an example, there's something like seven yes. or eight helplines that all have, yeah, there is. Yeah. all compete, all have different brands, different funding, separate. It's, it's somewhat crazy in the sense that um, if they all work together, they could spend more money on helping people, which is their mission, rather than spending it on promotion and branding so and, and, and splitting the funding that gets split amongst them. But that's not my, that's that, that's no. the same to discuss. But um, yeah, in short, imagine if imagine if we didn't have politics in the office. Oh, oh to, to add, New Zealand has the highest rate of bullying in schools, or one of, and also has the highest bully, rate of bullying in the office. Now, um, one of the other things I learned when I um, my my player committed tried to commit suicide, and it brought it all back to me. I went and started researching and found. So I thought, why do I ha why do I get bullied as an adult? Like I thought I left that behind at school, and it was just a school thing. It happens at school, right? But no, what I learned is that um, because I was subjected to it re regularly enough, I then learned how to behave like the um, victim. So I actually unwittingly okay. attracted it. So you can behave this, you, you behave many ways, but I behaved the way I did, and it attracted people, made people react. And it's funny, you might catch yourself. Um, someone might be. Um, I, I sort of describe it as annoying or weak or whatever, and you sort of want to go, oh, for Christ's sake, Hillary, just just move on and get that, you know, and you, you fire up. And that is exactly the example of how, as a human animal, and why my interest in psychology um, mm. is and what these patterns are and, and how to um, break them. So, yeah, Absolutely. I think I'll answer your question. You have this phrase, which I've heard you talk about, um, and I, I think I know what it means, but I'd love to hear it from you. You talk about um, something called a woke life, so W W O K E. So, what yeah. do you mean mean by that? Is it like like wake well, it's up? Kind of like a global, yeah, it's kind of like a global um, name for uh, the people that um, agree with me too, and anything like it. So, what yeah. it is instead of instead of being a lemming and going along, and going that's just what we've got to put up with. What can I do? I'm just one yeah. person. Oh well. You can't beat them, join them. Yep, let that girl get raped. Oh, hang on, now it's my sister or my wife or my mother. No, no, yeah. no, it's not good enough. So the, the idea of the woke community is that um, people are now not just uh, on their soapbox at home, but they are outwardly, publicly working together to uh, change the world. And um, I think it also has a negative connotation. It may actually have a negative connotation, but I'm telling it in a positive connotation um, because it's the... Um, it's, it's, I think it was I think it was used by a person in the sense of you know um, making fun of the woke community. You know, like, um, you know, like go and, go and find something else to do with your life. Just put it, you know, go, you know, if, you're, you know, if you're part of the woke community, just go and find something good to do with your time instead of wasting your time doing it. You know, trying to. And it's like, well, no. Like, what me too taught the world is that we can yeah. affect change, and. Um, you know, the, some of the things that people don't realise is that Libya, Egypt and Syria all overthrew dictators, someone which was 30 years in power, um, by using Twitter uh, as a tool um, because they couldn't block Twitter being an American-based uh, product. They used Twitter to organise the, their efforts. 
And um, you know, let's, it's not about the debate of are they in a better position now or not, because there's all sorts of other political pressures and people got their fingers in their pie and trying to stuff things around. But but the power, what it is an example of the power of the people, if you think back to the 60s and what other power, people power, um, is that you can actually combine to do this. And Me Too is an example of where the Western society, who is almost asleep versus woke, um, and just yeah. accepting what they get served, um, and you know, that's just how it is. So we just have to deal with it. So for me, I look at everything. You know, like why why should the same crime be uh, adjudicated differently based on whether you've got the money to hire an expensive QC um, or you haven't? Why why should there be why should adjudication be different based on the color of your skin? You know, there's a uh, four kids um, got off running around the airline carousel, which has actually got signs up and everything saying it's a um, you know, legal and it should carry. I think it can carry two years imprisonment and fine up to 150000 something. Uh, they got off scot free while a couple of kids, a couple of Maori kids, um, got uh, six months um, imprisonment for uh, what was it? Stealing some food. Um, I can't, can't remember what it was, but it was that they're obviously different things, but um, yeah. you know, like it's okay for someone to break the rule, it's not okay for the others to break the rule. Well, let's just say there's laws, and if, if you break mm -hmm. them, then you get the same yeah. equal punishment regardless of who you are, where you are, how much money you've got or not. Um, That's right, yeah. But yeah there's, um, there's so coming back to that kind of woke life, uh, when you were just talking then, I was thinking about, it was a comedy skit, it was uh, Amy Schumer, uh, but she was talking about the Me Too, and she was sort of saying, you know, there's all these um, younger females who were looking up to the older ones going, hey, um, do you think it's okay that we're treated this way and that, you know, um, you know, we're being objectified and, uh, and the older ladies were looking back going, oh, yeah, uh, it's totally not okay. <laughs> yeah. Why are we doing this? <laughs> and it took, like, this younger generation to go, come on, ladies, like, really? And then they were, like, woken up and went, oh, yeah, that's totally not okay. Why are we putting up with this? And that can apply to so many different topics as well, like you've talked about. So it's awesome to have someone shining a light on those. And, and look, I'm I'm doing nothing by comparison to some others, um, and, but you are doing something now by raising it in this interview. And the, the thing I'll add is that I believe a lot of it has to do with generations and how we're programmed, right? So yes. um, soldier on, soldier on. Uh, so we were taught to soldier on and not to whinge, right? So my little change the world story, I won't go through the whole thing because it, it's quite long, but um, th this little part of the loop will make sense is what we're talking about is that um, the Matrix and the, the blue pill and the red pill absolutely yeah. made it so sci-fi. It um, made the it made the concept ridiculous. But say we take the red pill and um, we, we um, just carry on, or we take the blue pill and we see the real world for how it is and, and challenge it. So if you take if you're one of the people to take the red pill and just carry on, essentially what you do is you you go to kindy then you go to primary school then you go to intermediate and you get a, a junior uniform then you go to high school and you get a, a much nicer uniform with a blazer and you're looking pretty cool and snazzy and you got all this structure and, and put in place and, and this comes back to the um, education for the third revolution so that people the parents could go to the factory and, and press the buttons on the factory and, and do the work um but we just we just wake up now or we just born in 1976 and that's just the way it is. It's been that way for a hundred years. We don't question it. That's yeah. how society. That's society, right? So you just become a, a cog in society. Um, but the the thing is that you know you grow up, um, you meet someone, and you you rinse and repeat. So you know you work Monday to Friday, nine to five. You, you hit the piss on Friday. You play sport on Saturday. You might go to church on Sunday. Or you, uh, then you rinse and repeat. And then you have kids, and you teach them to do exactly the same. And um, yeah. the that this is a thing that we are uh, caught up in, and as we grow up, we are programmed with things like, "Oh, don't rock the boat," or oh, "Don't, don't be the, don't, don't stand out to being the, you know, you don't be the old one out. You don't want to be the dick." Don't tell tales. Um, yeah, don't tell tales. Don't tell tales. It's, like, it's the yep. truth. So, it's all tale. <laughs> so there's an interesting one. Um, Kate Daly, who's the head of HR for BNZ, was speaking at the Journey to Excellence event, a great event that I think every man should attend, but it's full of women because it's uh, sorry, woman. Junior, oh, junior, junior to excellence, yeah, woman. Um, that, so anyway, the room is full of women and it's women talking about all this stuff. And um, Kate Daly, who's head of HR, and 
I um, I asked a question because she used the term whistleblower, and I said, um, my question was, do you think we need to change the labels and language we use because uh, language forms culture? And if we're calling the people that are telling tales whistleblowers, mm -hmm. then it creates a negative connotation that we're never going to break. Therefore, because um, I, I always, could, as a kid, I could never get this right, part of being bullied by my brother. Um, so I, I was in hospital the first four years of my life, probably half a week on average. So he used to get upset that mum and dad took all their time. And back in the 70s, there wasn't all the understanding of things today. So they didn't really take the time to explain. It was just do as we're told because we're you know, kids, our parents. So he used to bully me and beat me up because he was upset that I was you know, their focus. Um, and uh, just forgot the point that that was the context for. <laughs> um, we were talking yeah, about telling yeah. tales. Oh, telling tales, yes. So yeah. I'll be sitting there like I am now, and he'd just come along and pull the chair out from under me, and I would land on my um, tailbone and be in pain yeah. or whatever. And, um, you know, I'd go and say, hey, you know, that's just that, stop him. And they're like, oh, stop telling tales and this sort of thing. Um, or they didn't mm -hmm. see him. But all they saw was two, two kids that come to them and were having an argument. So I just like blanket, that's it. Um, yeah. And I said, oh, don't tell tales. Don't be a whinger. That was the big one. We used to really still, to be honest, fucks me up. Um, because yeah. my, my thinking, why why does the person that does something wrong get away with it because you're not allowed to be a uh, telltale or you're not allowed to be a whistleblower? So I was really upset when I was working um, and a manager of mine told me off for uh, um, – you know, raising a problem with a person who was uh, sabotaging my work. And he said, mate, you've got to learn. You're never going to get even. I was like, don't get mad, get even. And I was like, what? So you suggest I go, fuck him over, bigger than he's fucking me over, and then he won't, he'll stop fucking me over. He goes, yep, that's right. I said, so you as my manager, that I come to you to for support, for you to do something about it, because I've done all the normal things, and I'm at the point where I'm about to punch the guy. Um you know, this is time for you to step in and say, all right, here's the, here's the evidence, you know, and it's, science, if, it, yeah. if it doesn't, you get your written warning, and if it doesn't, then you go. And, um, you know, his, his way of managing the situation was um, you just go and sabotage him. I was like, what about the productivity for the company um, is one thing. And um, yes. and he said, he said, oh, it happens all the time. Just Just deal with it. That's just life. That's how it works. And this is this is what I got told as a thirty-year-old. So it's you know, or maybe it was a bit older than that, thirty something. But anyway, I just couldn't believe it. This is a, this is a senior manager in a business saying, "Go and go and play politics," um, rather than we just sort it out, right? So now come forward to Google Aristotle and the fact that people perform better in psychological safety. I was not in a psychologically safe environment. <laughs> I was a pretty manager. Um, so how excited was I about doing work? I wasn't. So what did I do? Yeah. I started interviewing and um, just doing the bare bones and, and you know, and go on. So eight years of knowledge left that, that um, building because of that. Well, it left that organisation. So, oh um, and, yeah. So And and speaking of businesses, because actually you, you work with a lot of different businesses. So, yes, you have your um, A Few Quiet Yarn AFQY events. And you've done this massive digital pivot on that since COVID because they were all face-to-face. -face, you know, it was very much about that connection with people and you've had to flip that. But you also do a lot of other things with businesses as well. Um, you might be um, probably most well-known for some of the training you do around LinkedIn and social media. I know my company has, um, you know, benefited from that as well. Um, but are there, what else do you do with businesses or what kind of other processes can you run to to improve um, cultural productivity or whatever it might so, be? Um, really good point. And, and just to touch on the LinkedIn training, um, while, I, while I call it social selling, what I actually train is um, how to help uh, be a buyer. And again, it's all empathetic communications and uh, related to helping the situation, not forcing the situation. So if yes. I could be so blunt as to say that um, some, some sales behavior is about forcing the situation. Um, and yeah. being a buying assistant is about helping the situation. And um, yeah, the other things that I do, I've always wanted to work in, in culture um, and people in culture. 
for obvious reasons that we've, I've just gone on about. Yeah, exactly. And I've had a I've had a um, little thing there called AFQI Culture Games sitting in a strategy document for the last four years. And while yes. I've been running around um, running AFQI events and, and connecting people for their benefit, I haven't really um, delivered on the things that I want to do. So luckily, um, it, was, it was really interesting, actually. Uh, it's funny how the universe works, right? Um, and this is it comes back to the mindset thing. I've been so I've been doing work with a counselor for over six months now, and it has made a huge difference to how I see the world because your perception is your reality. So, you know, for example, I used to be very angry at um, those that bullied me and still ruminated around it. They've long moved on, forgotten about it. They can't even remember it. Um, but mm -hmm. I'm stuck. so anyway, moving on um, and uh, seeing the world differently. So. I was catching up with a CIO and uh, we were just catching up. Uh, we'd never met, they'd never been to AFQY. Um, they're quite high caliber, let's say, um, and, and that's just setting the scene for what transpired because um, when we met and got to talking, um, learned that um, she had shared about the, so first of all, sorry, they said, and I'm paraphrasing all this, they had watched all of my videos, they'd watched all of my interviews, and um, they said that they saw a, a very empathetic person that was able to um, yeah. identify right. what the problem was and call it and call it in a way that got people positively engaged rather than their backs up. And um, I was quite blown away uh, by the fact that they had watched all the videos and could talk about them. Like I said, I, I didn't believe them to be going, I was like, so what ones have you seen? He goes, oh, I've seen them. Like, I've seen them on the <laughs> I like the question about this. And I like how you did this with this. I was like, oh, shit, you have. <laughs> okay. Um, you're being such you a busy person. Got fans, yeah. yeah, so you, you've been so busy, you actually have watched all of these. I said, but you've never engaged with them. He goes, oh, no, but I'm one of the people that have watched them. So, that, you know, I, I, I won't necessarily engage because I haven't got the time for the ensuing discussion that will happen. I was like, yeah, true. Um, he said, but, um, but um, what I wanted to do was come and approach you about doing something for my business. I have a um, team of people who are risk adverse and I adopt, you know, he, he's come into a new team, right? Come into a new organization. And he said, they're risk adverse. And what they're doing is shuffling the, the deck chairs work-wise. They're scared to do something in case there's a problem. And I think because of the historically how it was uh, managed. He said, the perfect example I can explain to you is that say we you were to do one of your videos um, and, and you had all these you did it on hyperlapse, but had all these boxes stacked in a room, and then you went and moved yeah. the boxes into all different little piles and then moved them back to the original stack that they were in. That describes how people are working in this organization. So um, he said, what I'd like to do is get you to come and work at, propose what you'll do, and we'll work through whether it's you know acceptable or not. But yeah. I want to, I want to I want Ryan the Lion to propose something um, to use that empathy and to solve the problem that I have. And I went, Oh yeah, okay. So what are we talking about? Like, you know, you five people, 10 people. And um, he's like, no, j just under a thousand. <laughs> I was like, what? Um, wow. So I was quite shocked, right? I was like, and I said, why, why aren't you talking to a professional or someone in the space? And he said, said, well, we've had those people for years. And if mm -hmm. I send a box selection of how to do things and the same stuff I've seen that doesn't work, I'll, may as well jump off the bridge. That's why I'm approaching you because I see something in you. I see something in those videos and I think you've got something there. And he didn't know, but I said, so well, actually in my strategy pack, I have this AFQA culture games, which is a culmination of all these things I've seen and done and been a part of and all the rest of it, you know. So who hasn't been in a team bonding thing where they do that thing where you, you stand up to each other, put your hands but not touching, and one person moves their hand, another person's got to try and follow, but of course they can't. So then they say, join hands and now work together. And everyone's like vomiting in their in their mind, going, "Oh, well, <laughs> doesn't solve the problem that that guy over there was sabotaging my work and sending misinformation to a client on my behalf and, and making yeah. me out to look uh, incompetent and useless, and then telling management lies about the fact that you know da da da." So basically, setting me up, me holding hands with them right now is not going to solve that. <laughs> um, doing something more real, more constructive will do that. So, there's a, I'll, I'll use three examples. So one is um, when I coach rugby in Auckland, it's done by weight, um, not by age. So I had third formers and seventh formers that didn't want to speak to each other. Therefore, I developed a whole range of what you could call classic icebreaker um, games that got everyone talking and got everyone. So the faster I could get our team to gel as a team, yeah, of course. 
So, you know, you are a rugby family during rugby time at practice and at games. You are a rugby family and at school. So you may not talk to each other because you hang out with your seven four mates and you hang out with your third four mates and you don't talk to each other in school. But you can give each other a wink or a nod as you pass. And if anyone's really in the shit, I do expect you to step up. So if some third form is getting beaten up, you seven form is, I want to know that you didn't walk past and ignore it. Um, but you don't have to necessarily hang out. But when we're in our rugby family, you are brothers in rugby families. And we do all these things, right? So we would get, we would be playing. It's usually about halfway through the season that all the teams would start picking up and playing like teams. We were doing so from about the second game. So we were always going through to the finals. Didn't always win the finals, but we were we were ahead of the uh, curve because we got our team together. Culture, um, right? Yeah. So that's one thing. Um, another thing is I worked in a company, um, and uh, on the first day of onboarding, I did an hour with this person, an hour with that person. And I was in the lunchroom and I said, say you're one of them. I said, oh, Hillary, um, I can't remember that, per that, that lady's name over there, but I, I met with her at 10. I met with you at 11. What, what's her name? And, and you'd say, well, I don't know. <laughs> and I was like, but Hillary, you've been at the company 17 years. And I remember that lady said they've been there 11 years. How can you not know each other's names for 11 yeah. years? Are you taking the piss out of me right now? Like, are you, like, you know, she's like, no, I don't know them. And I was like, one second. So I turned around and went, excuse me, excuse me. I said, I said sorry, I forgot your name. What's your, oh, Sally. I said, Sally, do you know this lady? No. Nah. I said, you, you know, you worked here for 11 years together. Yep, but don't know her name. I was like, I said, this, you know, there's only 53 people in this company and over 11 years, you don't know each other's name. And um, when I went into that company, what I didn't know is that there was a huge, like toxic culture, huge unrest. So the CEO, without any advice, um, put together two groups and split the existing cliques. So say you and I, Hillary, uh, are mates and we're one clique. Let's so put yep. you on one team and me and the opposite team. And then the other clique yep. we've been bitching about um, would split them up. So you now were with our adversary and I was with the other half of the adversary, essentially. And what happened in my first week was a stapler got thrown. <laughs> <laughs> um, because, uh, say, you in this case were screaming, you, you're like, Ryan, are you telling Sally everything that I said about her? Well, if you are, I'm going to tell you everything you said about her. You said that Sally was this, 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 and this, and people could hear it, so people could hear it and started collecting around the argument. And essentially these four people just started laying down all this crap that they had started, had been spilling at each other, and one of them picked up the stapler and threw it. Um the person that was throwing it ducked and didn't hit them. But at that point, one of the managers went, enough, and everyone scampered away. And here I was going, oh, my God, what, what, where am I? Um, but this, yeah, so not long after that, I read an article from HBR, which is how um, if people are happy, and this is back in 2007, if people are happy, they'll give a 30% more discretionary effort. Now, fast forward to the last few years with the Google Aristotle project, if people are psycho have psychological safety and autonomy to work, then they will be uh, much more happier in their work. Um, the last example is going back to my first job. And um, I went home, because I was still living at home, uh, and I uh, said to my dad, I said, oh, my boss, blah, 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 my boss, ah, blah, 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 my boss. Um, he'd been a bit of a been a bit of a um, prick, I guess you could say, or at least I thought so. And uh, my dad's advice was, "Son, I'll give you the same advice my father." There you go. I'll give you the same advice my <laughs> father gave me. Yeah. So this is how it happens, right? So the the society keeps on reinforcing this. Right? He goes, it "Says there will be a dragon wherever you go. So it's better the dragon you know than the dragon you don't. If this dragon's okay, then just keep your head down." And do the work. That's what you're there to do. You get paid to do the work. That's it. So he said, mm. don't tell anyone about your personal life. Don't tell anyone about what you do outside of work. Just go to work, do your job, and then come home. Yeah. And I was like, I was like, that's. And I, I said to dad, then I said, that's shit. Like I spend eight hours a day with these people. I should at least know them and get on with them. You know, like why? Why wouldn't we want to, you know, get on with each other and be nice to each other? Um, how can you? It's almost like being battery hens. Go along, sit there, lay your egg. <laughs> and he's like, that's just how it is, son. This is how it is. And I was like, oh. So I've always been. So I've I moved jobs. My my father was in the same company. I um, went up through the ranks for forty seven years before retiring. 
Now, he wanted to retire with his golden handshake and set up a rugby bookshop. And by the time that happened, Google and Amazon mm-hmm. had taken away that possibility. Uh, so he well, still yeah. gets his rugby filled by using Facebook, and he's you know historian for Targa Rugby and does a whole lot of stuff around rugby, but not his rugby bookshop. Um, so me, conversely, I changed jobs. Um, a, I travelled on my OE, but B, if, if something, if a situation wasn't good, then why, why stick around? You only have one life. Yeah. If you can't change them, then you can change the fact that you're there. And yes. uh, so I, guess I was a very early, um, I, I'm not millennial age, I think I'm just out of the bracket, but I am, you know, millennials were the first um, generation to start changing jobs um, compared to the, the earlier generations. But I just yes. thought, why, why did you get yourself? Like, when I was at school, all I wanted to do was leave that school. I wanted to go to another school. I asked if I could be a boarder at another school and I'd never tell parents why. I just wanted, oh, I just wanted the experience. I see, you know, I see the boy, you know, da, da, da. all I wanted to do was get away from it. So um, in some ways, yeah, I feel like I've just realised something there. In some ways, I was always running away from my problems rather than facing my problems and sorting them out. Mm. Thankfully, I can add to the fact that I have since done the counselling around the bullying and... I won't say have totally sorted out, but am at the other end of the spectrum rather than what I was like as a, as a kid. So, so yeah. And so do you take uh, those experiences as part of the culture games and oh, then yes. actually craft some culture, <laughs> games, some culture that, games that work, you know, that aren't holding hands yeah. and, you know, yeah, so the the holding together. hands and being kumbaya. Um, it's about really addressing and facing the, the, the issues. And I haven't quite worked on all that. I'm working with um, Andrew Steele, um, for, who is, who, interestingly, his father worked with my father. He used to, him and his, or his sister used to babysit our, our kids. I used to babysit their kids. So we, we, we know yeah. our families are pretty close. Um, yeah. but he, he's a bit older and he's um, a few years ahead, I guess you could say, but has been the HR director of Telecom back when it was Telecom. Um, same with Fonterra, travelled the world doing it. So he has an HR people and culture background. So yeah. what, I, what I talk about is he brings a science to ensure yeah. that I don't know what that CEO did at the company I joined and, and do something without knowledge of what the actual effect would be by splitting the clicks up and having them end up having a war. Um, but then I bring the um, School of Hard Knocks experience and empathy and, um, for the situation. And I think the, the key thing that as was said, the ability to identify um, a situation and work out what to do with it and how to communicate it to people to bring them together. So yes. we're just in the process of um, creating that at the moment. Um, I'm certainly creating so it from my perspective. Um, and Andrew's, um, I guess I say, adding the science and ensuring that I don't uh, run off half-cocked into creating a bigger problem than the one we're trying to solve. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you won't. Some of that school of hard knocks, that common sense stuff is just absolute gold. So that sounds so cool. I look forward to hearing heaps more about that. Um, cool. So so this Thursday we have a very cool event coming up. It's one of your AFQIs. You call it the IT Reboot. Um, so it's sort of 5.30 from 7.30, but you can totally yeah. have your kids there. <laughs> Because <laughs> I'll be popping in and out. That's my new reality. So, um, how can people a, find out about that? Yeah, so usually my profile, um, I, as in my LinkedIn profile, I, there's a, there'll be a yep. post there, um, or you can actually, that the website's not updated, so don't go to the website. It should be updated. I'll do, I'll do that. Um, I've been, I've been a little bit distracted without going into the details. My wife has major surgery the week after AFQY, so I'm working out what's going to happen. Oh. In the looking at a six-month recovery um, just to give some sort of context but um, the AFQY the original event um, morphed into what is one of the other nine events in the stack uh, that I want to always wanted to release so AFQY experience talks was always meant to be a series of events with four speakers focused on a theme so that people could come to it and what what it was born out of is the early years of AFQY I used to get asked by young people all the time can you introduce me to that CIO? I, I, I yeah. want to mentor. And I was doing that, and the CIO was like, oh, this is really cool. I'm mentoring this guy, and it's fantastic. We're learning this and this. And, and both sides are pretty excited. So the idea of experience talks was actually to have four CIOs talk about their experience, experience talks, and the room full of young IT people and yeah. do a bit of IQ networking beforehand. They speak, and then each of the four speakers goes into a corner, and the people who the, the 
the uh, young people can go and speak to them and the sort of the rules would be and this is an example of identifying a situation and working out how to manage it is that, yeah. they would be that you can ask a question but you can't recite a book to prove how smart you are so ask a question yeah. or or they will be told to shut you down and move on to the next person if your question has already been asked don't ask it again in a different way except the yeah. answer that's given because this is what happened you go to these events and um someone will get up um, and, and recite a book and what they're trying to do is use the opportunity as a um, platform to advertise how smart yes. they are so yes. it wasn't about and you don't want so the problem is you don't want someone doing that you don't want someone owning all the year time so by setting out the rules and telling them in a, in a joking way about it um, and also um i guess highlighting what the negative side of um, doing so is i if you're reciting a book in front of everybody it's not going to be a great look for you um yeah. That they could uh, then There's go and expectations that people know how to behave yeah yeah um and the idea is that with having um four different cios at each event then a range of people would naturally hear what their experience is and be more inclined to say i'd like the opportunity to to work with them as a mentor than the other person because they're really talking to me whatever that subject was um yeah. but it, it, it sort of become different because COVID 19 was a subject um mm. and this one, the IT reboot, um, is different again. But the IT reboot concept isn't mine. Um, one of my big things is give credit where credit's due, right? Because I have had so many of my ideas. Yeah, so many of my ideas have been taken, and people go, "Oh, don't worry about it, get over it." It's like, yeah, but that person got the promotion and uh, you know pay increase because they use my idea. So what would happen? Why not be a little bit pissed off about that? I should have got that promotion. I should have got the pay increase. I should have got you know, so. Um, that idea is from Sean Mitchell from Tech Day. So Tech Day are running the IT reboot. They've got a website. It's like an, an online exhibitor hall, uh, and you can go through there and check out who's available and what they're offering. And he come to me and said, would you run AFQY at the end of the day? Like, we have a day of all these speakers and sessions, and then that could be the networking event at the end. And I was like, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, with COVID-19, we've got to uh, get everyone talking. So we've always had the no selling rule. Um, yeah. And we also have a rule where you can't ask the person what they do until the third question. So changed a little bit. You still can't sell as and you can't pitch, but you can say what you do and what you're looking for so that it helps you attract business in the sense that someone, so for example, if I'd say, I'm Ryan Ashton, and, oh, and you also have to use the meet the person principle. So you start with introducing you as a person. I'm Ryan Ashton. I live in West Auckland with my wife and my dog. I'm an avid rugby fan, but I also like uh, designing women's fashion, just to throw a bit of a surprise curveball in there. And um, I've always, 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 you know, watch with interest. Um, uh, but I run AFQY, and I prov which is a tech networking event, and I also provide LinkedIn services. So um, I'm looking for people to sponsor AFQY as a technology event, um, and I'm looking for anyone who wants to. Uh, or needs LinkedIn services, company page management. So if you need, that's who I am. Well, we don't cool. want people to say, hey, I'm Ryan Ashton, we run AFQY. It's the best tech networking event in the country, and we're just, we've just been running for 12 years, and people love it. You just wouldn't believe what some people say after they've been here. So once you know it, you love it. It's awesome, and uh, you'll, you'll meet some great people there, and, and you'll have a fantastic time having a yarn, and blah, 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 blah. We provide LinkedIn services, and um, I've been doing LinkedIn since 2008, and have evolved yeah. my processes with the platform. So we are the leading proponent of our LinkedIn services. So there's company page management, there's social selling training, there's personal brand training, Training. and the benefits of those are blah 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 blah. so it's so yeah it's completely it's different doesn't come across completely differently how good you are and just say i make rockets and i'm looking for people to buy rockets or i yeah. i'm in the street and i need people that want their street cleaned that's it awesome. um, oh. and it's been interesting on on one of the posts there's been about four where i've had to go and say hey i love the fact that you're um you know, in Matarangi, you've got the kids there and stunning walks on the beach and all the rest of it. But the way you describe what you do is a bit pitchy. Do you think you could um, click on the three dots and amend it? And, of course, they go and do it and then say, yep, yep, done that. And then I can go back and say, hey, great, thanks very much. So what it does, again, teaching people how to behave or showing people how to behave, is that for all those people that followed the instructions and um, the instructions say what to do, but they didn't say what not to do. They just said no selling. So... Some people have added stuff in, added in their pitchy bit. Um, 
everyone who's everyone who's seen the original going, oh, yeah, it's a bit of a pitch. How come you can do that? They've then yeah. seen me come yeah. in and say, hey, love it, but can you change it? They've then changed it and um, been thanked. So it just, again, it should, gives them the psychological safety that if you get it wrong, we can talk about it, we can fix it, and then that's okay. You're not going to get red carded for, the first, for, for a um, minor yeah. sort of first. Quite often, because you've um, definitely coached me from time to time on different posts <laughs> that were a bit eh. And I'm like, I don't mind because I'm on a learning game with this as well. And if someone's sort of telling me something that's helpful, I'm like, sweet, thank you. Like, that, that's awesome. So you're right. Yeah. So and, and how it's delivered and the helpful nature of it does make it come across so well. Um, listen, the other event or things that you're doing that I just wanted to make sure people knew about as well is your LinkedIn Live series, which is super exciting. So that only started last week. I think you've yes. already done about three which is i was like whoa he's packing a lot in here um yeah. very excited to be doing one next week with you as well and uh yeah i think that's a, a very cool pivot that you've done with that yeah well um i i hadn't been chasing it and uh my so i've been watching uh Robert do it and 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 lead the way against he's he's the benchmark and um you know Prior to that, I was doing recorded videos and editing them. And that's the interviews we talked about in terms of not just the child sexual abuse and intersex and cause-related stories to get them out there to, to tell them. Because I, I guess that's part of the other side is I help people tell their story where if they stood alone, um, uh, it may not be as comfortable as having the support of someone to help you tell your story is, um, again, psychological safety. So I was doing these um, um, interviews uh, for a long time, I've done over 60 interviews now, and yeah. you find them under hashtag a yarn with. And um, then the LinkedIn Live happened and, and Rabia started um, doing them. And of course, during COVID, it was great. He was getting some amazing, and still is getting amazing people in there sharing insights and stories. Um, and I was uh, focusing on getting the um, AFQI events happening and giving people that yes. community. So then I, went, I went, then I saw a few other people that got access. I was like, oh, if you've got access, I probably should have a look at this. Like, I won't just leave it and continue doing what I was doing. I'll, I'll pivot from the um, recorded interviews to the them as well. So, yeah, I went and applied for it. And as I mentioned earlier in the beginning, I thought I had lost the rights because I left it too long, getting things yeah. organised. Um, but, yeah, now, now now I'm underway and running and learning learning a few things the, the hard way. Um, but, it's a, yeah, I think it's a great experience. I think, I think the thing to work out for everybody is when's the best time to do them? You know, like if you think about you know, work doing work things, do you actually want to sit and spend your lunchtime watching that or do you want to watch it at night um, where you might maybe around your dinner, kids, maybe a TV program or yeah. gym workout, whatever you do to relax? But that's the, that's the problem is when – what is viewing time? So I look at it and go, um, A, they're, they're long, so who's got the time to sit for the whole thing? Yeah. You don't know what's necessarily in them, so you just got to bank on the fact that um, it's Ryan, Rebecca, um, Ash, Brandon, whoever it is, um, is going to uh, tell a good story or, or get a good story out. Uh, so what I'm looking at um, is is how to give people more um, more insight and understanding, which is why I set up the public calendar and I put ours. I don't know if ours is in there. Yet. It is in the public. Yeah, public calendar. So I promoted that through the email so that people can look at it. It's funny when I had Rod Snodgrass on yesterday, I had people because we were because Rod, love you, Rod, was slow um, getting the link um, and getting on. Uh, I had people messaging me, going, "Hey, where's, where are you and Rod? I can't find you." So they were <laughs> and um, and then of course when it comes on, um, yeah, yeah. So I think the I think for me what I'm going to do with it, and um, I hope others do as well, because then I can know in advance and not miss the good stuff. Um, is to be able to publish who you're speaking with, and what and what about it, what time, and try to identify what's a good time for everybody. Um, and I think I think one of the other things in general is there's just so much content out there now because of COVID nineteen. Everyone, you know, take my travel time. I used to travel. Um, just that means that's available and turned into um, uh, content creating time. Uh, so, <laughs> There's heaps out there, and it's I guess it's the um, as Gary Vinerchuk would say, it's the fight for attention, and for me, it's actually um, the engagement. So you can argue that yes, you've got to get the attention first for the engagement, but um, uh, that's one of the, the benefits of having built a, a personal brand around Ryan the Lion is that now people know um, 
to come to me for uh, people related content and that's right yeah. and that's where the linkedin live is going to go so um when we interview you it's going to be heavily people psychology focused with a, a hint of tech and also a hint of secret service secret agent stuff <laughs> but we'll leave that for everyone to find out about in due course oh well, excellent i really look forward to it and um this has been so fun because so often you're interviewing people, Ryan, and this has kind of flipped it around and, and been able to interview you. And, and wow, your your stories have been fantastic throughout. So thank you so yeah. much. So one thing we haven't touched on, Ryan, is actually your name because you are Ryan Ashton, but everyone knows you as Ryan the Lion Ashton. So tell me <laughs> why that is. Where did that come from? Yeah, so um, there is actually a rational explanation related to what we're talking about, um, but it did start with being a child, uh, as a child, and having an extremely loud voice. So it was either called the foghorn, usually it was shut up foghorn, or, <laughs> um, uh, you know, go and find Ryan the Lion, you'll probably hear him first. Um, but I have a naturally really loud voice, and if we go to the rugby one day, especially in a Targo game, um, you'll hear me like, I got a phone call one day at Eden Park when Otago were playing Auckland and someone said, are you over on the other side of the stand? <laughs> we can hear you. And can you shut up? And like my wife will also, like she, when we go to the rugby, she'll say like, I'm not going to sit beside you. I was like, why not? She's too embarrassing. And, um, and she said, all the people in front of you hate you because your voice is really loud, right? So we were in the stadium, Tago! and everybody like, rows in front of me all spin around and glare like what the hell just happened jesus um so yeah it's quite can, can get quite loud so that's where it actually started but of course um as you get go from young kid to teenager you want to leave that behind so i tried to lose it it came back um uh, through very funny means but i won't distract from um what i realized is that uh so oh sorry i, I will i will tell part of that so my wife's former boss um is known as john the pirate and i'm pirate hey, he'll go r so he'd call me ryan the lion and go raw and to begin with i was just like oh god i feel like i'm four years old again um but because we'd have our teams drink together you know, like friday drinks my my company nikki's company we'd all end up meeting up and he always go oh ryan the lion ryan the lion so I'd be walking through the CIO summit and um, I think it was Owen McCall, who was CIO of the warehouse at the time, across the across the thing goes, ah, Ryan the Lion, you're here. And you hear, you just sort of see the, or hear the people thinking, what the fuck? So I ended up putting it on my LinkedIn profile and I thought this is either going to be the biggest embarrassment that I will never live down or it will work um, because it'd be so memorable. And and I, I sort of refer to a few things as being an accidental, you know, accidental genius, um, in the mm -hmm. sense that I, I did things for one purpose, but they ended up having a much better, deeper meaning. So, coming back to when I talked about my father and how he said, um, you know, keep your nose clean, go to work, do your work, don't tell anyone about your personal business, and, and get out of there. Um, that was what it was in to 1996. And now we talk about bring your whole self to work, and we still don't. Um, anyone that says they do, I think that's not quite yeah. true. There will be some, there will be some leading examples that do, but there will be some that I think are still hiding some behind, right? Because of the fear of what people might say or, or whatnot. And as we move out of that space, the more people, the more people that lead with sharing more about themselves or be themselves more, the more we will leave the the people talking about it behind. Like we'll, it'll flip from one to the other. But um, you know. In our, when we grow up, we have nicknames. When we're in our sports team, we have nicknames. With our mates, we have a nickname. We have nicknames everywhere except in our place of work, usually, um, or at least in the corporate space, right? So what what Ryan the Lion is about is um, showing that you can, you know, still be still meet the person and um, it's not the end of the world. You know, it actually is breaking down those barriers um, and you know I've, I've had people that wouldn't accept my invite on LinkedIn because of it and they've talked about it later when they met them and oh my god now I know who you are and what you're doing and why you're doing it oh I'm so sorry it's like that's okay um, but yeah it is a little bit weird and that's that's why it works so well because it stands out um, uh, but yeah the, so in short it's uh, to help people identify that we can be our true selves genuine and authentic or just keeping it real and we don't need to hide behind a mask um 
and because that, that's the the old school way, the old status quo that we're trying to shake off. Yes, yeah, awesome story. Thanks for sharing that. Now, if people want to find out more about you and what you do, so you've got your your website. So where, where is it, where's the best places to point them towards? Is it LinkedIn Actually, or my personal LinkedIn else? profile is the best place. Just come and send me yeah. an invite and and personalize it so I've got context of why you want to connect with me. Um, whenever I get one from someone who hasn't sent me a personalized invite, I'll have a look at their profile. But if I if I'm not excited by what I see on their profile, I'll just I'll, I'll just ignore it. Um, and in, talk about that in LinkedIn training one day around um, connection collecting and how it affects your viral, virality of your posts. Um, it's measured by LinkedIn's algorithm. But um, yeah, send me, send me a message and just say, hey, I'd like to catch up and talk about blah, 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 blah. Or I'd just like right. to, because I like the content. And you know, for me, if you, like the, if you like the content, my hope is that you will engage with the content and develop the conversation. Like I'd love to get people involved uh, or engage in the conversation. So yeah, but if you, if you want to connect with me because you want to sell me the next widget, probably not. Um, like you can still connect yeah. with me, but don't try and sell me the widget, please. <laughs> <laughs> Might get to that, but not not on our, not on our first date. Yeah, no, fair enough. Awesome. Well, thank you very much, Ryan the Lion Ashton. It's been awesome. Take care. Thank you very much for having me, Hillary. It's been great. It's been awesome.